Well, hello, class. Hey, Michael, it's nice to see you. Uh, I'm glad you stayed up all night for this. Hopefully I'll make it worth your while. So, uh, I hope you guys had a nice break last week and have come back to class this week ready to learn. Because this week we are going to revisit the concept of extremophiles. Only this time we'll be talking about organisms that can handle extreme cold. And there are many different types of extremophiles, and we really have just barely begun to scratch the surface. But you'll recall from the last or from the first lecture that extremophiles are organisms that tend to grow better or thrive in extreme conditions. And there are a few different terms that are used to describe organisms that can handle very cold conditions. In temperate regions that get extremely cold, some organisms are adapted to living through wintry conditions, and during the rest of the year, they function more or less normally. But when things start to get cold, they have to have some sort of strategy for surviving extreme conditions created during the winter season. These organisms are usually not considered to be true extremophiles because while they may be exposed to some very extreme temperatures, they don't necessarily thrive in those conditions. They are just adapted to persist through those conditions. These types of cold resistant organisms in temperate regions are usually called chionophiles. And this is a name that derives from the Greek word chion, which means snow. When conditions get very cold seasonally, organisms that are highly mobile usually either migrate to someplace warmer or they hibernate. And we're all familiar with the concept of hibernation where organisms like rodents and bats and squirrels and bears go dormant in this sort of deep sleeping state during the winter. Usually what they do is stock up on resources within their body and then live off of those. And then they shut down almost entirely. Hibernation is a pretty interesting process. Most organisms that hibernate do so by lowering their body temperature and slowing down their heart rate and their breathing rate, which slows down their metabolism. And then they do not need to eat or drink or really do most of their normal body processes during this period. And really harshly cold temperatures are one aspect of winter. Uh, another is the absence of food. And in fact, most insectivores, like bats, for example, they hibernate partially because most of the insects die when temperatures become colder. Or sometimes the insects have stages of their life cycles that are basically just not active in the environments where the bats feed during those winter months. And so insects are basically not present on the landscape at all during the winter months in most temperate regions. And if the bats tried to survive through winter with their normal metabolisms, they would starve and die. All right, let's consider, for example, frogs. Frogs mostly eat insects, but they are far too small and not mobile enough to migrate to any place substantial during the winter. Also, frogs are ectotherms, like the Greenland shark that we discussed on our lecture on longevity. This means that they are cold-blooded, or perhaps more accurately, their body temperatures are usually pretty close to the ambient temperatures in their environment. And as a result, frogs tend to hibernate through the winter in temperate regions. Aquatic frogs will 
usually just swim down to the bottom of a lake and sort of hang out in the cold, oxygen-rich bottom waters, hibernating above the muddy surface of the lake, but under the water all winter. And if you're asking yourself right now, hey, don't, don't frogs breathe air? Like, with like lungs and things? They do. So how can they stay underwater all winter long? Well, it turns out that frogs can also breathe a little through their skin. It's a process called cutaneous respiration. And in fact, there are many different types of organisms that get some portion of their oxygen demands by breathing through their skin. Amphibians, like frogs and salamanders, are famous for it. In fact, there are a whole class of salamanders called lungless salamanders, like this one, that breathe entirely through cutaneous respiration, to the point where their bodies don't have lungs anymore at all. And while we think of fish as breathing dissolved oxygen from water, mostly through their gills, fish also breathe through their skin, particularly fish like mudskippers that can also breathe air. They can obtain about half of their oxygen directly through their skin. But what about mammals? Can they breathe through their skin? In fact, yes, they can. Bats, for example, have a lot of blood vessels near the surface in their wings, and they typically get about 10% of their oxygen by breathing through their skin. Oops. And you? Do humans breathe through our skins? I mean, do we breathe through our skins? In fact, we do as well. Just a little. Maybe 1-2% to 2 of our total oxygen enters our bodies directly through our skin. For frogs, breathing through their skin is a normal winter activity, and it is easier to do in the water during the winter. This is because cold water holds more dissolved oxygen than warm water. How much more? Well, about twice as much in the winter as it does in the summer in most lake systems. This is because cold water is denser and the molecules are closer together, and this actually suppresses the release of all types of gases, including oxygen. You could basically think of it as it's harder for gases to form bubbles and escape when the water temperatures are very cold and the water is very dense. And so what happens is more of those gases stay trapped in that dissolved state. And in oxygen-rich winter water, frogs can breathe enough oxygen through cutaneous respiration that they can stay underwater more or less indefinitely as long as there is dissolved oxygen in that water. Terrestrial frogs and toads, however, they, they don't actually live in the water, and they don't have this type of adaptation for hibernating through the cold of winter by burying themselves at the bottom of a lake. Most toads will instead hibernate by digging holes in the ground, or sometimes finding holes that other organisms have already dug, until they are under the frost line in the soil, and then they will hibernate there throughout the winter, using the warmth of the ground to keep from freezing. However, 
wood frogs, and a few variety of tree frogs. They opt to handle the extreme cold of winter differently. Wood frogs are very interesting because they're the only frogs that can actually live north of the Arctic Circle. And this means that they are always forced to survive through very harsh winters. But unlike toads, wood frogs are not very good at digging. And so instead of hibernating, wood frogs simply freeze to death. They stop breathing. Their heart stops beating. There's no brain activity in the organisms at all for the entire winter. And in fact, up to 75% of their body freezes entirely. Except, wood frogs don't actually die. Because when the harsh winter temperatures begin to rise again in the following spring, wood frogs simply thaw out. They come right back to life from a frozen state. And that's right, frogs have already discovered cryostasis. And despite hundreds of people who have been frozen hoping that one day we will find technology to unfreeze them, humans still have not figured out how to unfreeze and come back to a living state. But every spring, wood frogs do it. Often going from being nearly completely frozen to hopping around like a normal frog in less than a day. How? How do wood frogs do this? Most organisms, they, they don't tolerate extreme cold very well. Be, well, because most organisms are mostly made of water. Adult humans, for example, are roughly 60% water. And when water gets below the freezing point, ice crystals start to form. And nothing good happens when ice crystals start to form inside your cells. The reason that this is bad is that because the hydrogen bonds that tie water molecules together, when they freeze, it forces the, the structure, the molecular structure, to expand in volume by about 9%, in fact. And when ice forms inside the wood frog's body, it somehow starts to pull the liquid water out of their cells. So the frozen crystals that are there in between the cells basically begin to sort of suck that water right out of their cells, causing them to desiccate. And in normal organisms, this would destroy the cells beyond repair. But wood frogs, they resist this by creating sugars in their liver that are redistributed throughout their body cells. And these sugars function a bit like antifreeze, keeping the ice from forming inside the cells and keeping the cells from desiccating and from them being damaged completely. Wood frogs are considered chionophiles, not extremophiles. Their strategy for staving off freezing, however, is one that many extremophiles also employ. That is, they avoid freezing, at least partially, by creating a type of antifreeze in their bodies. Another impressive chionophile that uses a similar type of antifreeze to survive for an entire winter, and this might surprise you a little bit, it's the woolly caterpillar. Uh, they're known for the myth that their orange and black coloration can somehow predict the intensity of winter. 
woolly caterpillars are basically just the larval stage of tiger moths. And like most caterpillars, the woolly bear caterpillar spends its winter mostly hibernating. But woolly bear caterpillars can, like the wood frog, live far into the Arctic Circle. And as temperatures get colder, these caterpillars will move the water in their body towards the outer cell layers so that when it freezes, it doesn't actually damage their internal cells. And like the wood frog, our woolly bear caterpillar friend, and other freeze tolerant caterpillars will create a type of antifreeze from sugars. And they use this to keep their internal cells in their body from freezing. The freeze tolerance of the Arctic woolly bear caterpillar has been tested and they can survive through temperatures as low as minus 70 degrees Celsius and come out the other side just fine. In fact, Arctic woolly bears have even been frozen into a solid block of ice for an entire winter and once melted, survive completely unharmed. Woolly bear caterpillars can even thaw out during the warmer phases of some winters, and they may even be found moving around on the landscape during sort of warmer phases, and then they can be frozen again and thawed out and frozen again for many different cycles in a single winter without any ill effects whatsoever. Turtles are another type of organism that can't migrate through harsh winter conditions, but still find some way to survive through them. Turtles don't really hibernate in the strictest sense, but rather their metabolism does slow down a lot. And sometimes turtles can be seen slowly swimming around under the ice in lakes in the dead of winter. Often they will actually partially bury themselves in the mud at the bottom of lakes for a winter. And in lakes where the water freezes over the surface, these turtles manage to more or less, like frogs do, get some additional oxygen from that cold water. And like the frogs, turtles have specialized in cutaneous respiration. Where frogs have pretty permeable skin throughout their bodies, turtles are mostly hardened shells and tough skin. So there isn't much skin for them that can be easily breathed through. Except, well, around their butts. The technical term is cloacal respiration, but it's basically butt breathing. So some turtles, like the painted turtle, for example, uh, and snapping turtles, they can also switch their metabolism temporarily so that they don't even need any oxygen. But this party trick, unlike butt breathing, is a dangerous one for the organism because it can cause acids to build up in their muscles. And if it isn't dealt with, it can actually be lethal to the turtles. Painted turtles like this one, cute, colorful turtles, they're found basically everywhere. They actually specialize in this sort of trick. In fact, they can steal calcium out of the shells in their bodies to help neutralize the acids that build up in their systems. The painted turtles have been shown in laboratory studies to be able to live for more than a hundred days in a row underwater without ever coming up for air. In a future lecture, we will probably discuss organisms that can live with very limited oxygen. But for now, let's get back to organisms that can tolerate cold.
Low temperatures are challenging, as I mentioned, for most organisms. Many organisms have water as a major component of their body. And also, temperature actually affects many other environmental conditions. As our examples of turtles and frogs have shown, it affects the concentration of dissolved oxygen in aquatic environments, for example. But it also affects things like metabolism and growth rates. And this is because it also strongly influences the rate of chemical reactions. And most organisms have finely tuned temperature ranges with well-defined optimal conditions and very low tolerances for temperatures that are outside of this range. In this sense, organisms that can persist through seasonal extremes of temperature, um, that they're impressive, but as I mentioned, they aren't truly extremophiles. To be a cold tolerant extremophile, you have to have an optimal temperature that ranges somewhere between minus 20 degrees Celsius and plus 10 degrees Celsius. And these are usually what we would be, uh, what we would consider to be true cold environment extremophiles. These are extreme cold tolerant organisms and they are called psychrophiles or sometimes cryophiles. Psycho is a, a Greek root word meaning cold, and scientists will occasionally use the term psychrotroph rather than psychrophile. The idea here is that some species can grow at or below freezing temperatures, but they tend to grow best at temperatures that are slightly above freezing. These are what scientists usually call psychrotrophs. But for the purposes of this lecture, we will just simply refer to all of them as psychrophiles. Some of the most common and the most extreme psychrophiles are bacteria and archaea. These are simple, single-celled, prokaryotic organisms. In other words, they have cells that lack a nucleus. And while they don't normally have the same charisma as multicellular organisms, their ability to withstand extreme cold temperatures is very impressive. As an example, one group of soil-dwelling bacteria called actinobacteria, for example, well, they are capable of entering a sort of suspended state. And uh, functionally, it's sort of similar to hibernation. They manage to sort of persist in the frozen tundras of Siberia and Antarctica and in some cases, they've managed to stay in this frozen state for more than a half million years. And they can then be revived from this state. In modern conditions, sort of dethawing them and making them some of the oldest living organisms on Earth. But as I mentioned in our lecture on longevity, that's only because they're cheaters. But you don't have to be this simple in order to be a psychrophile. There are many examples of eukaryotic and multicellular organisms that are capable of withstanding and even thriving in very cold conditions. Let's take, for example, the elegant sunburst lichen, which can photosynthesize at temperatures as low as minus 24 degrees Celsius. And they have been found actively growing at temperatures down to as low as minus 10 degrees Celsius. They are common in both the Arctic and the Antarctic. And lichen, as we've talked about before, are organisms that form a symbiotic relationship between an algae and a fungus. Basically, they're just like a fungus that has figured out how to farm. They grow algae inside their bodies. The bright red color that you can see on this species gives the elegant sunburst lichen its name. And it comes from a reddish-orange 
pigment. This pigment is called a carotenoid, and it acts like a photoprotectant. It keeps the lichen safe from UV damage, allowing them to withstand very high levels of UV radiation. That's right. Our elegant sunburst lichen is also a radiophile, and in fact, a polyextremophile. They can handle extreme desiccation, just like all the other radiophiles that we discussed in our first lecture on extremophiles. And that isn't the end of the list. This lichen is also metallotolerant, which means it's able to withstand exposure to high concentrations of heavy metals that would normally kill other organisms. And it's also a nitrophile, meaning that it lives thriving in conditions where there's excessive nitrogen, like on rock surfaces near bird and rat nests, which is where they're usually found growing in their highest abundances. And the elegant sunburst lichen also have been sent to outer space, where they have shown the capacity to withstand the hard vacuum of space and ionizing radiation for as long as 18 consecutive months in a row. In fact, some scientists have even proposed that we should send the elegant sunburst lichen to Mars, well ahead of any human arrivals, to help terraform the planet. As they almost certainly did, helping to create soils from rocks in the early part of Earth's own history. The elegant sunburst lichen holds another special significance for scientists, and those that study Earth's history in particular. Because on top of being polyextremophiles, the elegant sunburst lichen also has an incredible longevity. Some species have been known to live for well more than 5,000 years. And in fact, because of its fairly reliable growth rates and its widespread occurrence around Earth, it is one of the lichens that are commonly used in the science of lichenometry. That is, a science that's using the exposed rock surfaces and lichen growth to try to figure out how long those rock surfaces were exposed. They do this by measuring the diameter of the lichen that are growing on the surface. When they're round, like this one is, and they grow outward from the middle. We can often calibrate this against man-made structures with known dates, like for example, buildings or gravestones, where lichen commonly grow. It is odd to find algae growing in very cold temperatures. But one group of aquatic green algae, called sanguina, they specialize in growing directly in snow. These algae are called snow algae, and they are in fact responsible for a phenomenon known as watermelon snow sometimes also called blood snow, because of the bright red or pink color that their red pigment will create. Like the elegant sunburst lichen, their pigments are carotenoids. Watermelon snow occurs at very high elevations, where there is a permanent snow cover. And during the spring, the additional light and the melting snow triggers sanguina to release flagellated algal cells that swim to the surface of the snowpack and they form these bright red crusts. These algae actually darken the surface enough that it enhances the snow to melt more. While watermelon snow is kind of unsettling and also interesting, I would recommend that you don't eat the red snow. The green algae sanguina are actually a primary food source, however, for our next group of psychrophiles. 
ice worms. Ice worms are restricted completely to living in the snow or ice of glaciers. They only grow to be about one to three centimeters long, and they feed on algae, like the snow algae that we were just talking about. They will also eat anything else that will basically fit in their mouth that's, you know, living in the snow, like bacteria, or some scientists have suggested even pollen. Ice worms and their cousins, the snow worms, are not just cold tolerant, but they actually cannot handle warm temperatures at all. Ice worms have a very narrow temperature tolerance range. In fact, these ones have a species name that's Solifugus, which means it flees the sunlight. Many of the cold tolerant species we have already discussed are like the ice worms and snow worms. They manage their cold temperature by producing a type of natural antifreeze. And they tend to become more active as the temperatures get colder. And they have an optimal temperature of right around zero degrees Celsius. But if they get cold enough, like say temperatures below minus seven degrees Celsius, they could actually freeze. What happens if the temperatures get a little bit warmer? Well, if the temperature gets above about five degrees Celsius, ice worms will self-destruct into a pile of goo. And this means that even just picking them up and holding it in your hand will literally kill one of them. In Cordova, Alaska, they actually even have a festival dedicated to the ice worm. Glacial ice surfaces are also the home of some of our old favorites, rotifers and, of course, water bears. When dark colored dust accumulates on the surface of glaciers or on snow caps or snow banks, it darkens that surface and it changes the amount of light that actually gets reflected, just like our snow algae did. In science, we refer to the amount of light that's being reflected as albedo. White surfaces reflect a lot of light, and dark surfaces tend to absorb a lot of heat as a result of not reflecting as much light. And adding a little dark material to the surface raises the temperature around this material and causes the neighboring ice to melt during the day. Over several days, if there is some dark colored dust on the surface of the snow, the snow will become pitted around these dark particles. And these pits provide an area for more dust to actually accumulate in the pits themselves. And this is a sort of feedback process that leads to the formation of shallow pitted surfaces on the snow or the ice filled with dark particles. And in science, we call these things criconite holes. They look something like this. Dark, small holes on the surface of a glacier or a snow cap. Kraikonite holes are a type of microenvironment in snow and ice covered areas. During the daytime, the dark dust materials that cover the bottom of the pits result in ice and snow that melt. And so we have little pools of water. But at night, they refreeze. These Kraikonite holes are often sites where psychrophile communities can develop and several species of freshwater rotifers and water bears often thrive in these types of communities. But how do these organisms even get into these criconite holes in the first place? Well, since rotifers and water bears are, as we already know, experts at surviving desiccation, they are probably just blown in along with the dust particles and land in the same places on the ice as the dust did. Desiccation and vitrification 
are two other means that organisms use when attempting to live through very cold conditions. And in the past, when we have discussed water bears, I mentioned that most of the extreme conditions that they live through, they do through, they do through their sort of vitrified or ton states. But the water bears that are living in cricanite holes, they're actually true psychrophiles. They persist through the freezing, but when the ice melts and we have that very cold water in those cricanite holes, that's when those water bears are actually active. Okay, so snow algae are not the only type of algae that can actually live in very cold temperatures. In fact, the algae that are most tolerant to cold temperatures are actually found frozen into the sea ice itself. Sea iced ecosystems are quite diverse and they include a range of algae, and bacteria, and even ciliates that will graze upon these things. And what makes this feat so interesting is that these organisms all live in small, brine-rich channels between the ice crystals themselves. When people who live in temperate climates want to melt snow and ice in the wintertime, they usually throw down some salt this is because salt lowers the freezing point of water, meaning that freeze salty water, temperatures have to be a lot colder than freezing. And for fresh water, typically it freezes at zero degrees Celsius, as we all know, but salty water usually requires at least two more degrees in order to start to freeze. But when you freeze salt water into ice, the ice is actually fresh water because the crystal structure of ice has no room for salt in it. And this means that the salt actually gets purged from the ice itself. And what happens is it makes the water around the sea ice even saltier. This increasingly salty water creates small pockets of brine within the sea ice. And because of the elevated salinity of these brines, they cannot be frozen without substantially lower temperatures. And it is in these liquids, several degrees colder than ice and several parts per thousand higher salinity than actual seawater, that these sea ice communities live. Like other extremophiles that we have discussed, Sea ice algae and ciliates living in the sea ice are polyextremophiles. They must manage both extreme cold and hypersalinity at the same time. Many of these organisms are algae, and a large fraction of them are diatoms, although some are also dinoflagellates. Diatoms are a special type of microscopic algae that forms a silica cell wall. And like other types of psychrophiles, these diatoms and dinoflagellates and the ciliates that live in these sea ice communities, they do so by creating natural antifreeze within their bodies. Most of these algae will also create uh, similar pigments to those that are in lichen or snow algae which provides some protection against UV radiation. And some of these algae are even adapted into living in very low light conditions because they often form at the bottom of the sea ice itself. Our final example for today's lecture will be psychrophilic insects. These are insects that can handle extremely low temperatures, and they are particularly interesting because most insects die during the winter. And so there are, are so few organisms that can handle extreme low temperature settings that the fact that so many insects have adapted to live and even thrive at very low temperatures is pretty impressive.
The Arctic Midge, this thing here, shown mating, is Antarctica's only true insect. And also somewhat surprisingly, it's the largest native, purely land-based animal on the entire continent, although it only reaches a maximum size of about 6 millimeters. The Antarctic Midge occurs only there and nowhere else, or as scientists would say, it is endemic to Antarctica. It normally, midges just look a little bit like mosquitoes, although they don't actually bite humans. And the ones in Antarctica are actually flightless. It's thought that perhaps they lost their wings as part of an adaptation to being blown places they didn't wish to go because Antarctica is so windy. While Antarctic midges can handle conditions as low as minus 15 degrees Celsius still walking around and functioning normally in these conditions, the typical temperatures in Antarctica often reach temperatures that are much lower, like minus 40 degrees Celsius. So these midges usually avoid the coldest periods by burrowing down into the snow or ice. Also, like most of the psychrophils that we have discussed today, these midges cold harden. They pump sugary proteins into their cells. And also similar to some of the other organisms we have talked about that are resistant to cold, the Antarctic midges are also resistant to desiccation. They could lose up to about 70% of their body water and still survive. Like other true psychrophiles, these midges best function at temperatures that are at or below freezing. And somewhat surprisingly for an insect, they cannot actually withstand temperatures that are above about 10 degrees Celsius for prolonged periods. In fact, if temperatures get above 10 degrees Celsius for longer than a week, they will perish. Antarctica is a harsh environment, and while the midges are the only insects that live in the continent, there are some other bugs that also live in these very cold conditions. Um, they include things like cold-tolerant springtails that are sometimes called snow fleas, and a parasitic tick that lives mostly on seabirds and a non-parasitic mite. There's actually a fairly wide range of other psychotrophic and psychrophilic insects in other parts of the world, but their stories are all pretty similar. The theme of developing antifreeze to harden against the cold and specialized forms of desiccation and vitrification and finding ways to keep the most important cells from having ice crystals form within them. Many of the coldest places are also areas where UV radiation is quite high, and most scientists that do research in places like Antarctica can draw some comparisons between these cold, dry, high UV exposed landscapes to alien planets, or even to alien periods of our own planet, because Earth's distant past was very different than it is today. As we move on through the semester, we are going to return to the environments and the adaptation of extreme organisms again. And I'm somewhat curious, what has been your favorite extreme organism that we've discussed so far this semester? Is there one that we haven't talked about yet? I want you to let me know either in chat or if you're watching this lecture later, perhaps post your favorite in the comment section below. I'd like to hear about them. Next up for me will be office hours tomorrow night, and I have some plans to look at some more lichen materials live under the light microscope. So perhaps we will see some more water bears and nematode worms and rotifers and other extremophiles. I look forward to chatting with you then. Michael asks, don't some of the cells in our eyes do something like that? Or is it one of those fake 
facts you hear through the grapevine. Hmm, I'm not sure about eyes. Um... <laughs> You're very happy we don't have to butt breathe? Well, uh, it would be a neat party trick, I suspect. Uh, let's see. Would eating red snow kill a human? I don't think so. I don't think that the green algae that live in the snow are actually toxic to humans. But I still wouldn't recommend it. Let's see. Lawnmower says, I like the vital organisms that live in others and burst out of them like from aliens. Yes, the parasite organisms were very interesting. Yeah, it is kind of a hard question thinking about what our favorite extremophile might be. Although I have one that we haven't quite gotten to yet, but we will eventually. Um, okay, well, I, I think that's it for tonight. We're getting close to the end of our lecture. And if there are no more questions or comments, then I will look forward to hopefully seeing you tomorrow during office hours. And uh, we'll talk to you then. It's been great. And we'll see you next week.